I'm Christy. Today I want to talk about intake meeting where great minds plan and think alike. So the day of our intake meeting arrived. We had scheduled it so that we could hopefully be done in time for it to get AJ to work on time. The meeting went longer than anticipated, so he ended up missing about half of his shift at work, but it was a productive meeting. It was kind of a big meeting with three different groups represented. My husband, AJ, and I represented our family. His caseworker from the government entity that helped us find this particular placement was there, along with her supervisor. And that there were three representatives from the organization that oversees this particular group home. During this meeting, I realized that AJ will always have some form of an IEP, or Individualized Education Plan. While no longer pertaining to his education, Almost every organization we work with creates a plan for him so they know what his goals are and how they can help him. It also serves as a measuring device to see how much progress he makes over a certain amount of time. This makes sense when you stop to think about it. There really isn't another good way for these organizations to keep track of who needs what without a written plan for them to follow for each individual. And each person's path is so different that they can't really make one generic plan for everyone to follow. But I have to admit, it's also a bit disheartening. I thought I was done with IEPs, and technically I am. But I still have at least two different organizations working with AJ to create annual plans for him. It means a few extra meetings over the course of the year. But it also helps us see AJ's progress and the areas he can, needs to continue to work on. Overall, it's not a bad thing, just a new realization that some things won't change the way I thought they would. The intent of this meeting was to rewrite AJ's annual plan. We reviewed last year's plan, but knew that it needed significant revision to apply to living in a group home. So we made some tentative new goals that we all think are appropriate for AJ. I appreciate that we'll have another meeting about a month after AJ moves in so that we can take another look at this plan and see if the goals we set are still appropriate and applicable to the situation after AJ's had some time to adjust to living in the group home. We also spent a fairly significant amount of time discussing exactly what's needed to get AJ moved in. One thing I didn't anticipate and had never thought about, needing two rooms of furniture to live in. Fortunately, the government organization has access to one-time funds to purchase the furniture and other necessary items needed to furnish AJ's room in the group home. This means that his current bedroom furniture can remain at our house so he has something to use when he comes home to visit. I'd never stop to think about this potential issue. We always assumed that we'd move AJ's things into the group home with him and figure out things at our house. We're fortunate that this is a reasonable issue for us to address and figure out. As we were in this meeting though, I realized that a lot of families aren't so fortunate. For many families, this provision of the new room furnishings is the difference between this, their loved one having a place to live or sleep in the group home or having a place to live and sleep at home. We also discussed the management of AJ's finances. The short answer is that the organization that runs the group home will oversee AJ's finances. From what I understand, and I still have a few questions, they will set up a trust in AJ's name that they will use to fund his income and expenses. We can request a copy of the ledger whenever we'd like so we can see how they're handling the money. And if the balance gets too close to the $2,000 limit set by SSI, they'll then request the information to transfer some of the excess into his ABLE account. This trust will receive his SSI money annually or monthly as well as his work paychecks. A portion of his paychecks automatically goes to him to provide extra spending money. The rest, well, we're a bit unclear about that. We think it either goes to help cover the cost of the house or possibly is used to pay some of the, or repay some of the taxpayer funds that are being tapped to help support him. This is one of those questions that we need clarification on. In the end though, their plan covers all of AJ's expenses while he lives in this group home. The organization budgets to cover all his basic needs we will have to provide nothing extra. If you want specific snacks or extras that are more than the spending money he's provided, we'll have to cover those. But all of his basic needs are provided for. That's a relief. It also means that we could walk away and never worry about him again. No, that's not even a remote possibility for us. And it's nice to know that all of AJ's roommates are still consistently involved with their individual families. We intend to do the same. 
We also talked about what doctors AJ would use once he moves into the group home. The organization that runs the home has a system in place. It seems pretty extensive and well thought out. And since I'm okay changing AJ's current doctors, we decided to switch him to the doctors this organization uses. This means that the doctors already know how this organization functions and what they require for paperwork and orders. I figure I don't need to come in and mess up a system that's working smoothly. They also use a pharmacy and set up a system to dispense medications in a way that supports the staff in administering all medications appropriately and accurately. Again, we'll switch AJ to their pharmacy to avoid messing up their system. After the meeting, we took the caseworker to see his room. She agreed, it's a small room. It'll be interesting to see how we fit a bed, desk and chair, dresser and nightstand in it. Overall, I'm excited about this opportunity for AJ. I don't like losing control of his finances, but I do see the upside in knowing that he's taken care of should anything unforeseen happen to my husband and me. I'm still a bit skeptical that we were told the whole truth. Maybe I'm a bit jaded. I prefer to think I'm experienced enough not to believe everything I'm told. I'm hopeful that everything we've been told is indeed true. Two of his roommates have lived in this house for numerous years and their families regularly interact with their loved ones. I'm certain families wouldn't leave a loved one in a place they didn't think was safe or doing a good job caring for their loved one. I also remember hearing how our state government changed laws pertaining to organizations that were not taking proper care of seniors in their care. While things are now more difficult for these organizations, more oversight and accountability, it gives me peace of mind knowing that others are also looking out for AJ's well-being. Time will tell how things actually work, but the optimist in me is hopeful. As the move-in date grows closer, I'm excited about AJ's continued growth potential, and he still desires to live in his own house by himself. This will help us know if or when that's a possibility. I can't wait to see what the future holds for him. So my question for you this week is this. Have you ever had a meeting like this with multiple agencies involved at the same time? Was it a positive experience? I'd love to hear about it. You can leave me a comment below or you can leave me a comment over on the blog. That's at www.havenofhopeforme.com. This was originally posted in April of 2023. If you prefer, you can also email me at christy, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y, at havenofhopeforme.com. I'm grateful for so many others who are excited to help AJ continue to grow and succeed so that I can continue to say that life is good and there is never a dull moment.